Ben Grossberg is originally from Far Rockaway, New York. He was educated at Rutgers and the University of Houston. <laughs> from 2000 to 2008, he worked at Anatouch College in Ohio, where he purchased a small farm and, per and planted Granny Smith, you know, Granny Smith Orchard, which his second book is named. I think that's the coolest thing I found out about Ben. We were just talking about the apple farm. That's very neat. He is currently director of creative writing and an associate professor of English at the University of Hartford in Hartford, Connecticut. Ben is the author of Space Traveler, University of Tampa 2014, Sweet Core Orchard, University of Tampa 2009, winner of the Tampa Review Prize and a Lambeau Lim Literary Award, an underwater lengths and in a, uh, for underwater lengths in a single breath, from Ashland Poetry Press 2007, winner of the Snyder Prize. He has also published a, cha a chapbook, The Auctioneer Bangs His Gavel with Kent State University. His poems have appeared widely, including in the Pushcart Prize and Best American Poetry Anthology, Poetry Daily, and Verse Daily, and, Verse Daily, and the magazine Paris Review, Southwest Review, New England Review, Missouri Review, and The Sun. A recipient of individual artist grants from the states of Ohio and Connecticut, he serves as assistant editor and regular book reviewer for Anatouch Review. Please welcome Ben Grossberg. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, thank you, Katie, for arranging this. What a pleasure to read uh, with Leslie and Dorian and Valerie, who are um, in addition to being wonderful poets, wonderful people. Uh, I, I'm going to um, start with um, uh, a slightly older poem uh, called A Thought. And uh, this poem has a narrative heart in it somewhere sort of buried. And I thought, um, since you don't have it on the page, I would sort of pull it out for you. This poem, um, like a lot of the poems I'm going to read today, they're all newish poems. Um, are about middle age, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> um, it's happening to somebody else. They're all, they're all um, and, and this poem is about, about an instance uh, that happened a few years ago where I thought some, somebody was flirting with me. I thought um, a man was flirting with me at a bar, and I was pleased. And then I realized that it was somebody behind me, <laughs> which I did not want to talk about in the poem. But... Um, <clears throat> But uh, I gesture at it, toward it in the post. So, all right, so a thought. By the way, I, I, I'm just getting over a cold, so my voice might be a little bit iffy. So if it is, just tell me, I'll try to speak up. A thought. <clears throat> like a feather descending in its back and forth motion, slow twirl down to one end of a balance, and that end begins to sink but so slowly that days pass, an unscrolling of weather, the view out the same window over a series of months. Trees burst in lime green flowers, so tiny that three or four buds could rest on the tip of your thumb. And then come rainy days, darker leaves and brightness expanding like the yawning of one just woken, everything unfolding, changing. And now you find it is autumn, and somewhere inside is a difference, a quiet, monumental thing, difference. Some dream had long seemed foundation wall to a structure you'd hoped to build, a Jeffersonian grandness. You'd imagined marble, imagined columns. But now it is you who seem to find the structure more trouble than it's worth. You, who might just, you decide, be okay without so much grandiosity. You even surprise yourself with that word, grandiosity, with its undertone of mocking. What was it? A word? A look from a man that wasn't? you realize the moment too late, directed at you. A small casual failure that added its name 
like another entry on a long petition. No one, not even you, heard the creaking sweep, the rusted iron gate of your will. Though afterward, at the window, you may have wondered what bird dropped that feather. Though so long ago now, there's no telling what kind or on its way to what country. <clears throat> so, um, more middle-aged <coughs> poems. Um, it's, there's there's going to be a lot. Uh, there's a lot of older people here. I know, I know, but but, um, but, 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 but the light in here is very forgiving. Um, <laughs> this poem was called In Medius Rest. I, 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 in, in Medius Rest. Um, and I was thinking, one of the things about middle age which has uh, newly occurred to me is that even though you are in the middle of things, you are old enough for the first time to understand the aftermath of things. Um, and this poem is a, a meditation, as you'll see, on that word. I'm trying to think if there's anything in here that I should unpack for you. Um, probably not. <coughs> in Medius Rest. My face is the aftermath of my face. It is a face after the big rumble. The buildings of my face are upward exhalations of dust. There will be aftershocks in the aftermath of my face. I have the aftermath of brothers, three of them. The aftermath of brothers is a tunnel dug through the floor of a prison and under the guard tower and fence with a spoon. The spoonfuls of dirt are childhood days, and you eat them. The tunnel is quiet. The aftermath of brothers involves dinner every few years, and sometimes email. I also have the aftermath of lovers. The aftermath of lovers is like the surface of the moon, a gray pulverized uniformity made of singular impacts. My face and I are the aftermath of lovers. The aftermath of sex is love, but usually briefly. The aftermath of love is interminable. My life is the aftermath of my childhood, and I am the aftermath of my mother's life, which means that my mother's life was my childhood, and that's eerily true. <laughs> Teaching is the aftermath of learning. Writing is the aftermath of reading. The aftermath of friendship may well be better friendship, but I haven't gotten there which means the aftermath of friendship lives in Minneapolis. And though I have long forgiven him, I can distinguish no road back. So the aftermath of friendship is that certain kinds of conversations become theoretical. The aftermath of a dog is a tin box. The aftermath of a dog may also be a cat. The aftermath of a dog is another dog is another dog. And in that way, dog reaches something like immortality except when it doesn't. And then the aftermath of a dog is a cat. Or getting home late and heading right up to bed. The aftermath of chocolate is the aftermath of my face. The aftermath of my face is a perambulating diet. The aftermath of having had parents is a constricting understanding of them. Surely the aftermath of something is a prologue, but maybe because it's a prologue, you can't know until it's an aftermath. The aftermath of a car is an insurance check. The aftermath of a car is, what's that word? Historicity. The aftermath of a car is another car, sometimes a better one. But the aftermath of a man may be no more men. <laughs> so um, I'm writing a lot about my parents, um, probably because I am now the age when I first remember them if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. you, mean, you mean they were, they, they were. are the age when they first had you? I mean, I, mean, I, 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 I am the age when I'm, I am the, the I don't even think I can do this. Okay. <laughs> when I, I first remember them sort of as people, they were the age I am now. So I guess I would have been, see. Age okay. of appreciation. Yeah, where you, the age where you look at your parents and say, oh my God, you know, you're, you're people. <laughs> so this poem is called I Go There, and the title is a little bit of a joke on that phrase, 
you know, don't go there, yeah. I go there. <laughs> Probably. It's safe to say that my mother never liked sex, though on some level she must have wanted it. She'd wanted babies, not necessarily children. She told me, <laughs> she told me that once with an uncharacteristic dreaminess. Even her pronunciation of the word babies, drawn out and hinting at music. But sex was clearly another thing. Reserved, I gathered, peripherally, as children do gather, after not too long, for vacations where it could integrate seamlessly with margaritas and those old plastic keychain photo boxes where you put your eye to the lens and see your mother, permed, your father in a suit, leaning into each other in the dining room of a cruise ship beside a table of strangers. There would be dancing, too. Father, over a foot taller, swaying back and forth. Mother, chugging her arms at her sides as if imitating a choo-choo. And then, back down for the chicken or the fish. They haven't spoken, not that I know of, in 55 years of marriage. But it's entirely possible that proximity itself communicates something. He still sometimes yells like a crack of thunder, loud enough to make the street seem to tilt up toward you at her and at anyone who criticizes her. At 43, I'm old, too old to know marriage like that. But sex I do know at three and six month stretches in a way they never will. And yet surely they know enough of it, if not in the act, in the decades they had to ponder its grievances. What other thing could have beckoned them at 19 and 20 to marry? I heard the story 40 years later, again peripherally, how he'd run to Mexico after and had to be dragged back by both sets of parents. <laughs> Is it even true? And from where did I hear he'd come back with, but how to say this delicately, an infestation? No, I'm sure she never liked it. And sure, he never got what he liked. Granted, my evidence largely humors bitter subtext flung during commercials across the couch, all but over the heads of children, a snapped rubber band. Last time I attended a wedding with them, they were the final couple dancing after the DJ finished winnowing by decades. A mutt and Jeff silhouette, her squat chugging, his awkward swaying, charmed to find themselves alone on the dance floor. They're not the people they were in that bedroom, more likely car, that first time. <laughs> and maybe it's a perversity in me that I prefer to imagine that, that torrent of appetite, like wrestling salamanders, glossy as egg yolks. No idea that they would or could grow up to be this, creaky, dancing, become sex, become dancing. I know nothing about love. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the next poem I'm going to write is an apology. It's called an apology, and it's it is an apology, and it's got a lot of narrative machinery behind it. So I'll try to unpack it just a little bit. Um, my guess is readers on the page might need to read it a few times to sort of suss it all out, but. I'm not going to drag you all through it twice, so I'll, I'll try to front load it. Um, this poem is about <clears throat> the most recent time and the first time. So um, the first time was in the early 1990s. The most recent time was about a year ago that somebody who I was dating told me that they were HIV positive. Um, and the poem uh, ponders sort of like, you know, who I was when I was told then and who I am now. and and. As I was writing this, I was, I was sort of thinking over the question, you know, um, I, I managed to get through those years without getting ill. Um, you know, luckily I, I made my share of mistakes, but, um, but how even, even then one is, uh, you know, suffers in the aftermath. An apology. This is uh, for Joe and it's uh, spoken to him. I know you have heard this before. In the waiting room, I would imagine red X's over some of us, a slash across our torsos, visible only to a large ripe eye, P. 
peering through the roof. First, there was waiting, then there was more waiting, and that was before we had to wait two weeks. It wasn't the thought of getting infected, not just that, but how the self would become a plate held at a careless angle, its contents slowly sliding off, and a dog circling, circling. And then once, I drove home from a man's house in tears, but nothing bad had happened to me. He told me on his couch, our feet entangled. A gentleman, he'd said it before the first article of clothing hit the floor. Amazing that it went further. Me, more wick than fuse, even then. That the salt, crusted from a day walking the Galveston seawall, how his skin held on to it, is something I can still taste. It made me pull sharply back. What, what is that? Before coming close. And last week, you told me over the phone. In response, I teased out your story, avoiding the implicit question about us. Yes, I know how you took it, my demeanor such news anchorly interest. It turns out something bad did happen to me, didn't it? And it was only later I realized that your words, even your tone, sounded practiced. Or no, not practiced, like something you'd actually said many times before. No way to know now if I read about it or lived it or saw a film in which a young man, 23, naked, glides in a clear pool, his body nearly fixed in aspect. On the patio above him, older men drink, languid in the subtropical night. Houston, 1993, 2, 3, 4 a.m. The club is all but abandoned, but the showers are going hot, and a single male voice, raspy as the scratch of a child's violin, calls over and over from the dark block of steam. Yes, thank you. Oh God, thank you. The halls are lined with doors. Some are cracked open, their light spilling into, brightening the hall. In one, a man, eyes shut, lies on his back, his face and skin bright with steam, his chest shaved as close as a jawline beads with it. Occasionally, a man wrapped in a white towel passes through the hall or places an open palm on one of the doors, pushes it, disappears silently inside. And outside, the patio, no music, no chatter, just the men splayed in the dark, their bodies rippling over onto themselves. And in the water, the young man. He circles, parts it so cleanly it forms a sheen of glass around him. It must be true. I hadn't realized until now that the young man isn't real. I don't mean he isn't real to the men on the patio, though that must be true too. To them, a set piece, a television at an airport, or suspended over a bar. Nor do I mean he is unreal to himself, though perhaps that's also true. That he knows himself a bathtub toy, a wind-up shark that will run down, grinding out its own movement. No, I mean he is unreal in a larger sense, uninhabited, a cipher that no one recalls being inside him now. No one can say whether there was a young man in the pool or if they just imagined him there, or if he imagined himself there from a small bed in a Houston side street, first floor apartment beneath a tower of yellow brick. No one saw him slide from his clothes into the water or glimpsed the underside of his body, face, chest, genitals. No one can confirm that he had a face, 
wasn't as featureless as a mannequin or a cool dish of wax. All the other men are gone now, scattered, dead. The hallway door is shut, the facility long since bleached clean and closed. And even I who write this can't attest to a single detail, though I do still hear as if from a nearby room, a raspy voice calling from the steam, the sound divorced from any other sound, from any shuffling of bodies, and nearly desperate in its gratitude. Thank you. Oh God, thank you. Yes. There will be no more sex poems. <laughs> that <part's done. laughs> We got that. <laughs> I feel more relaxed. I hope you do. <laughs> if you have cigarettes, it's appropriate to light this. <laughs> In the late days of the Republic. What should I say about this poem? Um, I could say this. Somebody mentioned this to me. Um, almonds and tomatoes are, um, uh, in terms of, of water uh, usage, they're especially terrible. Yeah. right? So, so in terms of, um, of environmental degradation, we will probably lose those soonest. Or they'll be like fantastically expensive. In the late days of the Republic. The markdowns were great. The racks of coats so full, you could barely browse from one item to the next, overstuffed, like a sandwich with meat dripping out the sides. Of the buffoons running for high office, we preferred the one who walked like a penguin. His little Il Duce routine amused us, and his hair, which had a translucent brilliance like something a princess would spin straw into. We knew he couldn't win, but it became fun to talk about, even to imagine, as entertaining as disaster movies from the 1970s with their single word titles, airport, earthquake, <laughs> meteor. We were, there's a phrase from Hamlet, incapable of our own distress, which is, if you think about it, not a bad way to be. When it finally did snow, we were relieved, as if winter, a friend we'd feared we'd offended, finally called. And it was good, too, how they closed offices early so we could walk around in it, like powdered sugar over the asphalt, our footsteps blackening in our wake. We were all about walls in those days. The big ones, sure, but also the small ones, how they gave shape to our little yards let us walk around naked inside them. And the electronic ones, where we could respond to people who thought exactly like we did in progressively finer distinctions. It did occur to some of us that this would result eventually in personal walls, that we might walk around with something like cardboard boxes floating around our midriffs. But hadn't stranger things been done merely for fashion? At least we weren't wearing bell bottoms. It was only when the price of produce started to rise that we paused. Almonds, and especially tomatoes. Only then did it seem we might have gone too far. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just going to read a few more poems, and, um, uh, and these are uh, in form. Uh, so I've been, I've been playing with some rhyme and meter. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the first of these is called The Finnish Carpenter. Um, and a Finnish carpenter... Uh, uh, m most of you probably know this, is somebody who does uh, the moldings. You can see in a house like this, the Finnish carpenter must have been extraordinary. Right, so the person who, who did you know, this sort of work as opposed to the actual building work of a house. Um, so this poem is a dramatic monologue spoken by a Finnish carpenter about his father. Uh, this is the pleasure of writing a dramatic monologue. M my father is also uh, an architect and the father of the Finnish carpenter in this poem is an architect. And, and to my thinking, an architect does just the opposite of what a Finnish carpenter does, <laughs> right? An, ar an architect is interested in, in structural, um, you know, grr. But the Finnish carpenter is, is, is the beautiful. <laughs> the Finnish carpenter. <clears throat> um, by the way, I'm from New Jersey. Woo! Yay. 
I usually don't admit that. <laughs> but um, but this. Jersey 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 Jersey. But th this this poem, a dramatic monologue, dramatic monologue, dramatic monologue is spoken from another person. You can write it in voice, and this is the first dramatic monologue I've ever written where I've tried to write it with a New Jersey accent. <laughs> so this poem is from New Jersey. By the way, everybody in my family speaks like this, and I still take this one with them. <laughs> <coughs> the Finnish carpenter. Half million and what? Cardboard, cardboard. Excuse me. Um, this poem. Uh, I said one other thing about four star is um, it, it, it's. If you all been in, in a, like a new constructed house, it's, a, it's about new construction. Finnish carpenter. Half million in what? Cardboard subfloors. Crap, but all right. Vinyl sided chimney. Looks like shit, but can't be seen indoors. That's something. But Jesus, what you can see. Door frames, wall openings, kitchen pass through. No moldings, nothing. It's like a face without eyebrows or ears. And we're talking new construction, nice street. There's window casing. I guess we should be grateful. <laughs> but they're my folks. Pop was an architect. And I say, look, Dad, I'll bring my goddamn miter saw. He walks away from me, shaking his head. Glad to do it, I say. Take me a day. He shrugs. I see his shoulders move. His hands sweep down in front of his face like he's clearing bugs or a smell. <laughs> Why not, Dad? Just a little crown in the den, some chair rail. He's 70. What happens? Shit ceases to matter at that age? Come on, I say. No filigree, just finishing. You still have that stepladder, right? He's on the couch now, remote in hand, surfing. I don't get it. I don't. Fine corners, cornice, some detail, a few planned correspondences. Why the hell not? Some lines to guide the space, hold it together. It frames the parts, gives shape and order, some wood. That's all I want for him. No games, just shape, a little grace. He's my blood, I want him to have it nice. Mirrors and smoke, he says, not looking up. He's been saying it to me 20 years, since I went broke, fixing my first place. Pre-war, Sears kit house, with nothing plumb, and me, wild on the phone, raving about warped floor joists and plaster. Smoke and mirrors, he said. And that's it. Done. And me, ankles deep in my disaster. <laughs> and the last poem I'm going to read, um, I'm also going to read a, a, a short passage after this, but the last poem uh, is also a formal poem. <clears throat> I've been writing lots of sonnets lately uh, because... Um, they're less intimidating. It's only 14 lines, right? Like this, <laughs> you finish a line, 13 to go. I find it, I find it very um, reassuring, and I need that lately. Um, so, have you, have you all seen a hummingbird? Yeah. I, I had not until very recently, um, and this is a poem about that. The hummingbird. This, in middle age, when all I've seen has taken on a tired resemblance. Birds in their morning scattering and men in theirs. Songs for sleeping through. The chance meeting, a splash of color that might open the heart. Well, it's self-inflicted violence to hope too long and no shame to settle in to what's at hand an empty bed and sense. Then this, this morning, the zinnias blurred to desert sunset and above them, almost still in sharp relief, the ink drop eye, the throat rouged blue. I've never seen a hummingbird, not this close. I could have brushed its needle bill with my fingertips or palmed its buzzing heat. Mm. Um, they just arrived in Kent, Connecticut. They're starting to migrate into Kent. Connecticut. And they are and beautiful. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Katie mentioned that it was Shakespeare's birthday, so she asked us to, to read a short thing of, uh, a short past of Shakespeare. So I, I, um, I, 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 uh, I love Shakespeare. My education, my PhD is actually in Renaissance Lit. 
Um, so I chose a, a short passage, which I thought would be good for the ending of our reading, in which um, I'm sure you all know, um, but it's, 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 it's as, as beautiful, I think, as anything in Shakespeare. <coughs> Um, so, uh, if you, if you, to set the scene, um, uh, Prospero has just put together, has just conjured up a mask for um, uh, Miranda and Ferdinand, and um, uh, he remembers that, uh, or actually, or it, maybe Ariel reminds him that 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 uh, Caliban is still on the loose and that he's coming. So um, Prospero gets real upset, and and, and the <laughs> the pageant, the vision, the mask, the dancers. Um, just disappears, and of course, uh, you know, Ferdinand Miranda are like, what, 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 uh, what just happened? And, and Prospero tries to calm them down. You do look, my son, in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir. Our revels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the <coughs> solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. <laughs>